Good morning. Sorry. The microphone helped. Um, so good morning, everyone. Uh, my name um, is Tabitha Carr, and I'm a student at the Guernsey College of Further Education. Um, and till recent, I was chair of the Youth Forum, um, which was supporting young people to have a voice in island issues. Um, but today, I'm very excited that I'm able to help chair an amazing panel um, of three fantastic people. But I will give you a short introduction before they properly introduce themselves. Firstly, James Partridge, who is the director of Face Equality International, which is a Guernsey charity he launched in November 2018 to campaign for face equality and challenge disfigurement discrimination worldwide. He was previously CEO of UK charity Changing Faces. James writes and presents wildly on disfigurement, disability and inclusion and achieved an international profile by becoming the first newsreader with a facial disfigurement on any TV news channel. Yeah. And secondly, the fantastic Jane Ozan, who is a well-known gay evangelical who works, to <laughs> who works to ensure full inclusion of all LGBT Christians at every level of the church. She is director of the Ozan Foundation, which works with religious organizations around the world to enable, basic bias, to enable discrimination that is released on sexuality, gender, in order to embrace and celebrate the equality and diversity of all. So I think that definitely deserves a round of applause. <laughs> and finally, Kevin Bales, who is the Professor of Contemporary Slavery and Research Director of the Rights Lab at the University of Nottingham. He co-founded the NGO Free the Slaves, and his book, Disposable People, New Slavery in the Globe Economy, has been published in 12 languages. A film based on disposable people, which he co-wrote, won the Peabody Awards and two Emmys. The Association of the British Universities named his work one of the 100 world-changing discoveries. He's published many books on slavery, and in 2016, his research initiative was awarded the Queen's Anniversary Prize. So as you can see, we have a fantastic panel, and I will let James firstly introduce himself in a little bit more detail. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and good morning to you all. Uh, I just wanted to say a little bit more about myself very briefly. Uh, some of you may know that I was involved in a car fire 49 years ago, um, and then I became, in the 80s, a dairy farmer here in Guernsey, just outside, just by the animal shelter there, and a teacher of economics at the ladies' college. And then I set up something called Changing Faces, and now I'm running Face Equality International. And I have to say that what I want to just focus on this morning is what Face Equality is all about. Because maybe you haven't heard about it. Well, you will now. Uh, here are some people that I know who've got some very unusual and rather unique faces. Um, you may know somebody who has an unusual face, perhaps somebody like I know who was severely injured in a house fire when they were three, or a woman whose face was badly changed by facial cancer, or the man who was randomly attacked in the street with acid in London, or a man who woke up one morning with a half-paralyzed face, and the GP said, oh, that'll go away, it's only Bell's palsy, and it didn't. He has it still. The young lawyer with a cleft lip and palate who's exceeding all expectations. A woman who's, who has the most resplendent facial birthmark. It's a port wine stain. She's actually thriving in the beauty industry. Now there's a thought. Or the actor who recently just died, sadly, Bill Simons. You may have seen him on Heartbeat. Who He said his his face resembled a World War I battlefield because he had been invaded by acne. And it did. It was pockmarked. 
Now, all these people and these folk here all experience and report that they are far too often bedeviled by other people's intrusive behaviors, their worn-out assumptions, their awkwardness, their embarrassment. They're hassled on social media. The abuse is appalling. They're restricted by low expectations. I particularly like that soft bigotry of low expectations that that was mentioned by June earlier. And altogether, they feel that they are unfairly treated just because of the way they look. And it's not just at all. It's not just. It's unjust. It's unfair. And so the campaign that I'm really promoting here in the island and in the UK and around the world, is for face equality. It's a fairly straightforward concept, really, when you think about it. Face equality is like race equality. People should be treated fairly, whatever their faces are looking like. Let me just go a little bit more into this, because I think we need to unpick what the experience is a little bit. Now, obviously, having a disfigurement, a facial disfigurement, is a bit like having a disability in that, Yes, there are some medical treatments. Most of us have had the benefit of surgery, whatever it is, medical treatments, lasers. But for the most part, that can't erase or take away the disfigurement. And of course, in poor countries, like this, these guys on the left here, that's a, a picture from Smile Train operating in Africa, trying to repair children's cleft lips and palates. It's a pretty good job, but that little boy is going to look different all his life. It is impossible to remove these (coughs) congenital conditions. So what we actually have to deal with is looking different in a society that has some pretty big problems with people who look different. And in particular, our argument is that we face what we call facism. It's got an E in it, facism, incidentally, so we just need to keep that (laughs) facism. Yeah, got that? Um, But facism has three almost unspoken assumptions, prejudices, biases, if you will, built in. And let me just describe them. Firstly, there's the prejudice of the sad and second rate. And this stems from the cult of perfectionism. We live in a global society where actually to look perfect is what we should all aspire to because that's definitely the passport to success, isn't it? Well, it isn't, but we are bombarded with messages that it is. And anybody who looks different and will always look different has to deal with that implicit bias in themselves. They've grown up with it, their families have, but also in the people that they meet. Oh, poor you. Sympathy and, I'm afraid, patronizing and low expectations come from this prejudice of the sad and second rate. The second is the prejudice of the bad, scary and undesirable. And I'm afraid to say Hollywood movies do nothing for us. People who look different, with scarred faces particularly, are so often lazily portrayed as the villains, the nasty, the odd the misfits, and that is unfair and unacceptable, and we have to get to to grips with it. But it's often the reason, or the justification, for ridicule, and you know anybody who's got a face like mine knows that Freddy Krueger and Two-Face and all these characters are liable to be used in the street whenever you happen to be just minding your own business. That's outrageous. Those things have got to be put into the bin of history. And the third prejudice is that somehow medicine will solve this. Medicine and surgery, magical stuff. Cosmetic surgery will fix it. And you should, James, you should, and all of you guys should, go and see the cosmetic surgeon, plastic surgeon, get it fixed. We don't want to see your faces, please. Go and get them fixed. Well, the reality is, aesthetically, surgeons, medics are brilliant, but they cannot remove these disfigurements. So we need to challenge these prejudices 
You may have them in your head too, dare I say. I certainly know I'm carrying around implicit bias about other people, other groups. And so the most important thing that I wanted to leave you with today was that actually we can make change. We can become conscious of these prejudices. I've spent a lot of my time through Changing Faces building up confidence programs, enabling people to create their self-belief and their confidence for, if I may say, tolerating living in this society. Because wherever we go, we are liable to meet these prejudices. They come out in awkward ways, staring, awkwardness, not knowing where to look, and so on. But also in the low expectations about work and possibilities and opportunities. I've spent a lot of time building up those programs, and I think they've been quite effective. But all too often, I'm told, well, look, James, it's all very well. It's lovely. Go, well done. Um, but you'll never change these prejudices. They're human nature, after all. To which my response is generally not printable. I've, <laughs> I've just written the, the word rubbish down here, and that's probably about as strong as I need to be. I think that is complete rubbish. I think we, it may take a generation to create face equality, but I take a great deal of strength from the campaigns for civil rights, for gay rights, for feminist rights, and so on. There is a lot of change happening, and I believe that we can make it happen here in Guernsey, most importantly, by becoming super aware, not just aware, super aware, and able to convince people who aren't in this room and that's the challenge, it seems to me. We've got to go out of this room. We've got to try to challenge the cult of perfectionism. We've got to make sure that ridicule, bullying, ostracism, unfairness and discrimination are outlawed. And law does make a difference here. It, it is important that people know that there is a background of law. They cannot get away with these things. And we should set that example here in Guernsey, it seems to me. And thirdly, we have to be absolutely open about the hype of cosmetic surgery. Let us all make an attempt to say, no, no, we don't need all of that. You can live a very, very powerful life looking as you do. Um, so, there's a lot to do. It's, it's not a straightforward agenda, but I look forward to working with everybody in the room and many, of many, many people who are not in the room because I think we need to engage with them too. Thank you for listening. Not sure what's going to come up. There we go, that's me. Um, <laughs> I think, yes. I can't believe that today is happening. I must admit, I am utterly thrilled. Growing up in the island as I did in the 70s and 80s, um, I never dreamed for a minute that we'd be sitting here in a conference, packed to capacity, talking about equality. And I really want to acknowledge and thank Alan and, and Kirsten for, for putting on today. Yay. Yeah, thank you. I... Um, as many of you know, I'm an openly gay evangelical Christian, and I am therefore committed to trying to change um, uh, not just the Church of England or the Christian denominations, but religions worldwide to look at how they embrace and celebrate uh, difference. And if I go back to my time growing up on the island, I, I, I must be honest, I did not even know that women could be gay. Okay? I lived in such a tight bottle. Those of you of my generation... Uh, may remember we, we, we had a lot of very camp men on our television screens in the form of um, Humphreys from uh, Are You Being Served? To, um, but they were always slightly ridiculed and uh, not portrayed exceptionally positively. I had male friends who were gay, and I, but I never knew that women could be. And so, um, sadly, I grew up knowing I was slightly different uh, not really fitting in. And it was only in my 20s when I ultimately found myself falling hopelessly madly in love with a woman I was working with. And it took her best friend to point it out to me uh, <laughs> that I began to realise that I personally had a bit of a, uh, a difficulty because I also came from a world, and I, I thank Guernsey for this wonderful routing, but I came from a world which was very strong in faith and I believed that therefore it was not possible to both be Christian and gay, and that started an internal conflict 
uh, within myself where I felt I couldn't talk to anybody because the moment I voiced what was going on inside, I would put myself on what I call the theological naughty step, that place from which there would be no return. I would be ostracized. And the truth is, actually, when I finally came out uh, only 10 years ago, that is what happened uh, amongst many of my colleagues and friends at that time. But it was the silence of the community around me, the lack of role models that caused the anguish for me that led me to a very dark place. I ended up, sadly, fighting for my life in hospital with my body physically going through so much stress that it was starting to react. The consultants doing test on, after test in the Cromwell Hospital and not really getting to the bottom of it. And I remember one young doctor coming to me and saying, Jane, if you ask me, you're just incredibly stressed. There's something you're not admitting. Now, I think, to be fair, it was probably pretty obvious to anybody who recognised or saw me that they might have thought I was gay. I didn't realise that myself, and it would take me another 20 years and time of going through what is called conversion therapy, where I went through an awful lot of prayer ministry, um, deliverance ministry, emotional healing ministry, to try and change my sexual orientation so I could fit in. So I could be the straight woman who would settle down and get married and have 2.2 children who would behave perfectly, of course. Um, and so, uh, sadly, that experience of going through conversion therapy and finding it didn't work when, in 2006, I found myself at Oxford University on a course for diplomats and met a very dear friend who I realized was having an impact on my heart, which made me understand that the 20 years of of therapy had not worked and that led me to an even darker place because now I believe there was no hope for change and the thing I was being taught was that I would have to be single and celibate for the rest of my life and that lack of hope for being loved for finding that intimate relationship with someone with whom I could build uh, um, a lifelong union was something that drove me a second time to hospital and a second major breakdown. And after that, I felt I, I only had the choice of coming out and risking the wrath of God. Because when I came out, I really did believe I was having to walk away from my faith. But my testimony is, praise God, that I found God walking straight with me. And I had to go back to the Bible and look at the passages that have been used to what I call clobber me with. We call them the clobber passages. And, and try and understand why I had believed what I believed and actually believed the truth, which, forgive me, I'm not, I know not all of you will be Christian, but the core message of the Christian, Christian gospel is that we are all loved passionately. We are created by a, a loving God, in, in, in my understanding, who creates us uniquely different, but loves us equally the same. And that is a truth that I believe the Christian church needs to rediscover and is trying to rediscover as we understand difference. I'm going to do a shameless plug for, um, for my book, not because it's about me, but it talks about the journey that so many LGBT people, particularly of faith, go through. I've got copies at a reduced price, which my lovely, <laughs> my lovely mother, who's here, will, uh, will, will sell you over lunch if you're interested. But... What it does is it, it's called just love because to me that is the core value that should unite us all, whether you are of faith or not, mm -hmm. that we love others as we ourselves want to be loved. And actually as a Christian I believe that we're called, the, the commandment that Jesus gave in the last few hours with his disciples was to love to a new standard, to love others as he had loved us, i.e. sacrificially giving ourselves to change, which is what I'm trying to do here. But the truth is all of us want to be loved. We all want to belong. We all want to be praised and receive a blessing. It's how I think the human race is created. It's uh, the story in Genesis, as some of you who might know your Bibles, God creates the world and everything he sees is good and he blesses it. And then the first thing that he says that isn't good is that man is alone, that Adam uh, was on his own and, and that was not good and so he creates Eve and we see this wonderful relationship with two people who find intimacy with each other but it's the quality of that love that counts and it's that blessing that so many of us want 
and search for and sadly find uh, that we can't have yet within the Christian denominations. Uh, it's starting to change uh, in the UK. It's changed a lot in the States. Uh, the, the Baptist Church will allow it. Methodist URC are, are looking at it. But the Church of England has still got quite a way to go. It's quite um, sad to me that uh, we can have services in Westminster Abbey where we bless our nuclear deterrents and those who work. Uh, and in fact, they do need our blessing. Um, but we can bless warships. We can bless guns. We can bless tractors and fishing boats. But we cannot bless two people who love each other. And that is something that has driven so many of us to a very dark place because we feel that we're second rate and we don't, uh, we don't belong. And so if I compare that Westminster service with another service that was held uh, a few months ago in Washington Cathedral, with the, um, it was a massive uh, national service that invited uh, many people to come and witness the interment of the ashes of a young man called Matthew Shepard. Some of you might have heard at the age of 21, he was battered to death for being gay. This happened 20 years ago. And his family, who uh, were very conflicted, they themselves were strong Christians about the fact he was gay, but also had accepted him, found it so difficult to, um, to come back to church. They had not interred his ashes. And Jean Robinson, Bishop Jean Robinson, the first openly gay bishop, led a service where he carried Matthew's ashes into an absolutely packed cathedral of LGBT couples and allies. And, and, and Jean, in his address, looked at people and said, this is a church that not just wants to welcome you, but wants to celebrate you. And that's what I think so many of us are yearning for. So today's conference right now, this session, is talking about how we move from tolerance to acceptance. And I would suggest the next step is to celebration of all our differences, celebration of the people we've been created to be, whatever that looks like, whoever we are, you deserve to be celebrated. You deserve to be lifted up and, 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 and told that you are beautiful, you are courageous, and you're acceptable in the sight of God. And that is the journey that this island is on. That's the journey that I think the church, I hope, is on, if it has the courage to do that. And that's why I'm so thrilled today that you're hosting this, because it is the step towards celebration that so many of us are yearning for. Thank you. Jane, that was wonderful. Um, Tabitha didn't mention that I actually have a Guernsey connection. It sounded as if I just helicoptered in. Sorry. But uh, let, let me just say that if, if this is a, a normal Guernsey community cross-section, um, though you can tell I didn't grow up here, I can be assured that if this is a, the normal group, 18% of you went to school with my wife, and 42% uh, of you are actually my cousin by marriage <laughs> several, several times removed. So, uh, so just think of me as that way, uh, as, as someone with a, a funny accent who happens to, be, happens to be around. I'm going to be talking about contemporary forms of slavery. That's the work that I do. And in many ways, it's, it's the point that be comes before the point of this panel about tolerance to acceptance. Well, I have to tell you that slavery is about othering. It's the othering that we've been talking about all the time. But to really maintain systems of slavery around the world, uh, you have to t have that rationalization. You have to have that mechanism where you other people to the point that it's all right to exploit them. It's all right to brutalize them. It's all right to sexually assault them and so forth. So I'm just going to talk a, a couple of things about what's going on with, um, in Guernsey. It's kind of interesting that uh, we worked together to do a quick indicative survey of guest workers in Guernsey, and we, because there had been some questions coming up, uh, as in part because I, I work on contemporary forms of slavery, people would come to me and say, uh, gee, there's this situation with these guest workers. Uh, I don't know if that's slavery. Maybe it's a bit of trafficking. Maybe it's like human trafficking. Maybe it's just a bad situation, and so forth. So one of the things that we were able to accomplish with our small group here called Abolitionist Guernsey was this indicative survey of, of guest workers. And I, I'm sorry this is so, so many 
so many words on a slide, which I, I kind of object to that myself. But it's a short survey. It's based on a European uh, normalized survey about working conditions. It was available to us in a whole series of languages. So we were able to meet uh, a number of different language needs in the population. We only uh, had 33 people responding. Uh, and so the, the results aren't in any way um, completely representative, but they're indicative of what's going on. We have quite a few guest workers on the island. Uh, there are, we're not saying that these are people who are caught up in, in, in slavery the way that I certainly confront it often around the world and sometimes in the UK. But that said, imagine if this described your job. Right? Imagine if this, what I'm about to show you, describes your job. Because these are the fundamental themes and norms and, and sort of mean responses to those, to those uh, questions on the, the survey of, of our, our guest workers. That you have a 52-hour week, sometimes ranging up to 108 hours. That you have a sense that you must work, no matter what your health condition is that you feel your half of you would feel your health and your safety is at risk on the job, that you are called into work at very short notice, yeah. rung up at night, said get in here, whatever, that it's very hard to take a break when you're at work, that, there, that you're discouraged and penalized for needing to go to the toilet, that one in five of you would have been abused, literally abused or threatened with abuse, that a third of you felt you had been exposed to these harmful situations, emotionally harmful situations, at least half the time at work. I have to say, as a person who was living on Guernsey for a number of years, being around guest workers, the, we have this wonderful, happy sense of ourselves on the island. And as a person who's trained and for years have been sensitive to recognizing these types of conditions, I wasn't seeing it. It was truly hidden in, in plain sight. More than half say, I can't take care of personal matters. I can't say at work, you know, gee, I, I've got a crisis at home. I can't go home. 40% working more than 10 hours a day, at least 20 times a month, really fits with the average hours per week. Three quarters working six days a week or more. And, and then notions of feeling discriminated. 13% discriminated on grounds of race, a third discriminated on grounds of nationality, and 10% on grounds of, of their gender. Now, this was an eye-opener, and I, I suspect it might be an eye-opener to you as well. It was an eye-opener to us, and we've only completed this a, a few weeks ago. But I think it's a, it's a space where we, we have among our community already such great charitable organizations like Ron Short, like the Blind Association and others who have been working with people with disabilities. But here among us is a bit of a hidden population. Here's the warning sign. So I'm just going to pop these up and say, now that you know that, in fact, it can happen here, here are the warning signs that you might, in your work, across your situation, to say, wow, it, 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 I'm chatting with someone. And perhaps it's because we're doing what... Jane was saying and saying, widening our circle, talking to people, and getting out there and find, meeting people more who are not exactly like us. And then in those conversations, what happens is somebody says, well, you know, I, I, I rarely get to have a conversation because I, I, I can't get out because I don't have any money to go out with. I'm working all long hours. I don't seem to have any breaks. I, I, and, you know, if, if you ask a, a couple of other questions, feeling questions, and then it comes out, well... You know, I thought I was coming here to work in a shop, but in fact, I ended up working in this horrible situation. And I have to say, that is very much the recruitment pattern for many of the people in the world who are taken into in situations of, of significant enslavement, that it all boils down to the moment when someone says, would you like a job? And they prey on people's hope for opportunity from bad situations, and they use that hope to transmute them into the material of enslavement. People talk about living and working on site. And that's been, that was reported in the survey as well. And experiences with abuse, 
no safety equipment, no, no, not in control of their own documents. That's one of the global warning signs, that if people's passports or identity papers have been taken away from them, which then paralyzes them in place, that's one of the key indicators that human trafficking is taking place and not in control of their own, own money and their own bank account. So just to say, we have a workshop at 1130, which is in, <laughs> <laughs> it looks like it's in about eight to six or eight minutes. Um, I've, I wanted to be very quick because uh, I think we can also talk about these things in the workshop. But if you'd like to know more about the work of abolitionist currency, please stop me. I'm very happy to tell you about that. And not, it's not just about guest workers or things that are happening on Guernsey. One of the things that we do in abolitionist Guernsey is address slavery around the world, and also in things like supply chains, the, the clothes that we wear, the food that we eat, the electronics that we buy. We know that there is slavery in most of those products, in many of those products. And we also support villages in northern India, which are coming out of hereditary forms of slavery, which they do by using a Trojan horse of a small school in these villages, which are primarily been enslaved for generations. And it's called the One Island, One Village Campaign. And so far, we're moving now on to our second village for complete liberation of families over a three-year period. Anyway, that's to tell you about abolitionist currency. Thank you so much, Tabitha. As you can see, we do have a wonderful panel, and I will be opening um, the floor for some questions. But before I do that, I do have a few questions that I wanted to ask myself. Uh, so I think I'll fire away. Um, a few of them might be a little bit hip and out there, because apparently that was my brief. As a young person, there had to be hip questions. Um, <laughs> so I might start with one. Um, over the week, there's obviously been um, Glastonbury going on. And I'm a big fan of music, and I love Stormzy. Um, so I have a bit of a question for all three of you. So over the weekend, Rappy Stormzy um, performed at Glastonbury. Um, he used his headline spot to wear a stab-proof vest and speak out about the injustice he believes young black kids experience, especially in the justice system. What injustice do you see around you today and for every age? If James, you'd like to start? Well, I mentioned some of, some of the injustices that I dislike enormously. I think one of the things that I really loved about Glastonbury and that particular Stormzy performance was that there was a sign interpreter yeah. mm. behind the scenes conveying the words out to the deaf community who were present at Glastonbury. Mm -hmm. I thought, that's cosmic. That is breaking the mold. Mm -hmm. So I hate uh, people being excluded yeah. for any reason. And I thought that was a great example of how not to exclude but to include. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's little things like that, isn't it, that sometimes we don't notice. Mm -hmm. um, that things like that are so important. And to us, we don't see those kind of things. You know, ramps being put in places or people doing sign in events. Um, so that, that's a really key point. I didn't even notice that when I was watching it. I was just more into the music. Well, <laughs> so. but, but actually the point is that you shouldn't notice the sign Integrated. interpreter. We don't need to notice that there's a big lift, which happens to help people with mobility issues and the parents with the big buggy and uh, so on and so on. So these things just become normal. They are absolutely the way in which we do things. And that's the way that we need this culture to go. So, I mean, one of the things... Sorry, I'm going to divert away a bit. From, <laughs> but one of the things that I'm really loving is the sight of some people with facial disfigurements appearing on, you know, everyday TV. Yeah. So Katie Piper and Adam Pearson mm -hmm. are frequently on people's screens because they are talented and mm -hmm. able, not because, oh, gosh, we've got to have the token crip, you know, and, and so on. So, yeah, it's... Sorry, excuse me, guys. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know what I'm talking about. 
Perfect. And Jane, I had a little specific question um, for you. I read Jane's book and thoroughly um, enjoyed it. So if you can get it for a discount price, which, you know, I didn't, uh, I would recommend... Sorry. <laughs> Good hit. I like that. You'll be, you'll be signing it. Right? I'll, I'll be signing it. Yeah, she'll sign it. Yeah. It's and like, write anything they want. But that will make them no, less it's, valuable. It's, yeah. it's a worth read. It definitely it opened my eyes as well. Um, and in your book, um, Just Love, um, I saw that you struggled um, for over 40 years um, with your faith and your sexuality combining the two. Um, and you, like many others, um, have experienced vast positive changes. Just being in this room, as you said, like seeing these, all these people sat here, which you said you never thought would ever happen. Um, and obviously, have you seen any changes within the church around same-sex relationships? And can you just share with some of us um, the changes and moves to equality you have seen? And obviously, we want to learn about how we can include more of them and so what more needs to be done. Gosh, can I have another hour? Yeah. Um, so I think the primary thing that's changing is the silence is being broken. Mm -hmm. For far too long we've put sexuality and faith on the too difficult pile, both as a church and also as a government, and I'll be touching on some of that in my workshop. And the difficulty there is in that silence there is a very loud um, voice of rejection to young LGBT people who think that they are not acceptable. Mm -hmm. And that sadly has led and is leading to severe mental health issues and indeed uh, even suicide. And that's what um, one vicar in a, a large evangelical church in Manchester who lost one of his young teenagers has taken his church on, on a journey of inclusion. I think the, 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 the thing I've, I try and um, encourage people to understand is that it is a journey and this whole... I think panel discussion is it is a, a journey from folk that will go from believing uh, frankly often through ignorance that I have chosen my sexuality that um, they do not believe that I could possibly have been born uh, this way or that um, that they believe I could choose to be celibate for the rest of my life not understanding the impact so that and then they may get to a point where they recognize that that is hurting me so they will come to a point of saying okay well, you're gay, but just don't do anything about it or don't tell anybody to, OK, well, we can see you've fallen in love and we can see the amazing impact that's had on your life, but perhaps keep that quite quiet. So, OK, yeah, we'll, 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 we'll accept it and we'll, we'll say that you can recognise it. So we'll bless it, but we won't let you to get married. To Do you see, there's a whole journey. Mm -hmm. And to expect someone to do a massive leap in one is pretty unrealistic. Absolutely. And in fact, many particularly within the church, uh, don't want to admit that they might be changing their mind because it means that they will be disowned by their peers as being unsound. So you have to recognise that and work with that. And therefore, I spend a lot of my time having private conversations or meetings, what I call underground, until there's a sense of, of momentum enough or people feel that they are a part of a group where they together can take a step forward and come out of the shadows. So with my own bishop in Oxford, he has been on a journey. He wrote to all his clergy uh, saying that they needed to respect and, and um, welcome the LGBT community. We've just, he and I have worked together and we've just launched a series of what we call chaplaincies across our diocese. And we've then written to every other diocese in the country saying, this is what we've done. You might want to think about doing that too. And now they're looking. So you can see change happening. Um, my foundation, just quickly, works on three principles of encounter, educate, empower. And the encounter is the most important part of that. Having that relationship, having that conversation with someone who hasn't knowingly met any other LGBT person. Of course, most, they've probably met lots of LGBT people in their lives, they just haven't realised they're gay. But building a relationship, realising that they're sort of, they're stereotyped, mm -hmm. are being blown away, and then educating them on a lot of the myths that they've had, and then empowering them to speak out. But just, I'm going to be very naughty, in the answer to your first question, the yeah. biggest injustice I'm very concerned at, about at the moment is the way we're treating our trans brothers and uh, our friends. Mm. Uh, that are particularly, yeah. um, what we see in any society, it's those on the, on the margins who get treated the worst. And I'm horrified by what's happened in mm. the States. I'm horrified by some of the vitriol and the rhetoric I'm seeing through the media in the UK. Our trans friends have gone through the most, and are going through the most difficult transition. They need to be welcomed and celebrated. And there's so much ignorance uh, on that issue. So I'm, I know that Liberate will be working, 
I presume on, uh, yes, well done, on the issue here in the Guernsey, the Gender Recognition Act. Um, you know, even today, just little things like having toilets that say male and female, or in churches where we have men's groups and women's groups, is so alienating to someone who's actually having, having, to, uh, having a, um, a transition uh, with their gender. So we need to become mm -hmm. far more aware of the, the pain that we're causing to a very small but very brave minority group within our society. Sorry. Thank you, that's all right. No, that's really interesting. You've got interesting. a long answer there. No, it's um, good. Yeah. And do you think that's quite similar for all of the areas? Obviously, you're all in very different areas, but that are so important that actually we can't just expect a leap um, of people just to accept or to understand. I suppose it is a step-to-step -step, um, understanding, but a lot of the time people say, OK, we need to understand, we need to be equal, um, but it's not just that jump, is it straight away, it's, it's a step-to-step journey. To step, yeah. Yeah. Um, right. journey. Col cultural change is very, mm -hmm. can take a long time. But one of the things about cultural change is that, or changing culture, mm -hmm. is that sometimes it all off, also works with what's called punctuated equilibrium. In other words, it goes along for a very long time and then suddenly, bang, something it's happens. It's a critical point. And, yeah. and you, you can never quite predict those, but I've seen them happen several times. Yeah. Uh, I'm old enough to have seen it happen several times. Oh. And, 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 and know that, that when it does come, it can change quickly, and it can change even more quickly in a manageable community like the community in which we live. Mm -hmm. But I have to say, you know, our trans friends uh, take it back over into my zone, and I will tell you that the othering that occurs oh. to trans people makes them one of the least protected populations yeah. in the world, in the world. Yeah. for enslavement. Yeah. So that even when you go into countries with good law enforcement, like the UK, like the United States used to be, uh, like Western European countries, you will find that even if officers of the court, law enforcement and so forth, will in some ways just say, but, but no, they're, tra they're, they're trans people. Right? Like, they don't count. Yeah, they, don't, they literally don't count. In those civilized places where you wouldn't, you'd least expect it. And I was this, my eyes were opened to this about 10 years ago in, or in New York with, with a group that said, you know, meet 30 people who have been enslaved primarily into forced commercial sexual exploitation, all of whom are trans. And, and most of them were in the United States from other countries that they had fled because of the violent and vicious discrimination and treatment that they had faced right. in their home countries. They had thought they were coming to a place that might have the, a modicum of understanding. I, I deal a lot with LGBT asylum seekers who are having to prove that they're uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender, which is pretty Im mm. impossible, actually, short of taking a camera in a bed, you know, bedroom that you just don't <laughs> want to do. Um, but they have, they have fled the most horrific, as you say, um, often at Uganda, Nigeria, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. African countries. You know, I've got two ladies who were nearly set on fire, both of them by their parents for being... Uh, gay and uh, have come to this country hoping for a refuge and found it just being horrendous and we're working hard with the government. Uh, m many of you may know I now sit on the government's LGBT advisory panel and um, that is one of the issues that we're really trying to, to, to champion mm -hmm. is how we work with the asylum, the refugee in our mixed. The, um, I, th I think there's something very true in what you're saying about change and how mm -hmm. slow it happens. Mm -hmm. I've been quite influenced by Malcolm Gladwell and the tipping point argument, and that is that you, you have to work up to, to some degree on some issue. I, I, one of the examples that I'm using at the moment is in India, the um, acid survivor community has really got more and more together and in one particular uh, location near the Taj Mahal, the, uh, a whole group of women who have been through acid violence have created a restaurant. Mm -hmm. And they, I mean, actually, the local authority wanted to close it down. There are all sorts of pressures. We don't want this, and we don't want it in, you know, near a tourist place. And, um, but they haven't given up. They have kept that protest going and I think I think we we need to support those sorts of actions I'm actually incredibly moved by the uh, the Greta Thunberg and climate change uh, kids movement because I think that is opening so many people's eyes and we're almost getting to the point where well this is the obvious thing this is the right thing to do I mean we don't do plastic we should 
you know, could we just agree to eliminate plastic in Guernsey? Yes, let's make it in a year. So I think there are movements that we can learn from, but it is journey, and cultural change, particularly shifting bias, is really, really difficult, um, but it can be done, and we can see progress, disability rights have moved forward, civil rights, and so on. So it's a journey, but I think we're on it, and the great thing is here we are, you know, yeah, on that moment with, mm -hmm. with Guernsey. And we could make, we could decide to make this a very, very inclusive community. But it takes leadership mm -hmm. above all. And I'm not just thinking of commercial companies. I'm talking mm -hmm. of the state has to actually grip this and say, you know, we're not going to pay lip service anymore. We're going to put some serious resource into this. Now, not just a one person here, and it's complex, and the legislation will take a long time, blah, blah, blah. That's, that's not good enough. We should be grappling and grasping it and saying, right, we're going to throw resource at this, get it fixed, so that actually we can live in an inclusive community with all the benefits that that will bring about. Given the um, time signal, and I could, uh, well, we could all talk for ages. Um, I have maybe a one more question, um, just overall. Um, you all have, obviously, connections um, to Guernsey, which I think is amazing. Forgot to mention, obviously, Kevin is married to a Guernsey girl, uh, so therefore he is probably related to half of you. Um, <laughs> and Jane is obviously a Guernsey girl herself. And um, I was going to ask you, James, whether you came here to be a dairy farmer, if Wikipedia was correct, which clearly it was. Um, but I had a um, question, um, firstly for Kevin. Um, you've made this island um, your home, and James, obviously, you came here to be a dairy farmer, and then you, obviously, are a Guernsey girl. And what do you each think are the unique challenges on this beautiful island um, for equal rights in each of your areas? Because I think it would be really beneficial for us to finish and understand what are the challenges for each of us in our certain area, but for this island specifically. Almost everything that's wonderful about the island almost becomes a challenge mm -hmm. for us in this way. Um, it's so beautiful here. Mm -hmm. and, and there are so many people who just mean well and do well. And the, and the cr crushing notions of, of commercialism and consumerism are here, but at a much lower level than you get in most of the places where I've like, lived like more than 30 years in London mm -hmm. and so forth. So it's an interesting tension mm -hmm. between, oh, I'm lucky to live in Guernsey, I'm complacent. You don't think that, but that's what you're doing. I'm complacent, everything here works pretty well. I read the press and I realize, oh, virtually every crime is the same 17 people headbutting <laughs> each other <laughs> a, after a, a, a night boozing it right down by the taxi rank. And you realize, well, you know, except for all that, I guess that's, we're, we're in great shape. But we're not, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we know that outside, things can be really horrific. But here, not so much. Now, yeah. all that really means is we just have to find what we can fix and, and to understand that better. And we have to think about those 30 or 40 families who have been living in extreme poverty and on, on state support and, and generating a great deal of the law enforcement mm -hmm. interest for the last, what, five generations on this island that have a kind of steady undercurrent role. That's, a, that's bizarre that we would even th not have thought about the uplift needed for that. Or the fact that Guernsey has the highest incarceration rate of any country in Europe. Mm -hmm. We have the highest imprisonment rate of any country in Europe. Now, I have to say, have a, as a person who's worked in prisons, in really ugly prisons, I, this is a great prison to go to. <laughs> but imprisonment is not usually the best answer for every mm -hmm. person who, who, who might have bumped into the law. So anyway, my, my answer to your question is, um, it's the beauty that... That, we, that enthralls us, that sometimes prevents us from seeing the ugliness which mm -hmm. is also among us. Mm -hmm. yes. You're right. I, I think, um, as I understand it, um, Hitler, bless him, uh, well, not bless him, but, um, <laughs> That's very Christian. <laughs> right. 
but had had plans to make Guernsey and Jersey the um, deaf chambers of where he would have brought all the, the British people in his black book to, to be killed. I mean, as many of us know, that the underground um, hospitals were never such things. They were there but built on a Belsen model to be death chambers. And we have this hidden darkness in our island, and you're talking that. But we also have incredible light. And I take what June said uh, about the fact that if we were to model inclusivity as an island, we would be a beacon that could actually really shine and touch companies around the world and, and indeed a UK government. Um, I, I work a lot in Mallorca, believe it or not, or, or holiday, which are trying to make themselves the go-to lesbian a holiday destination because the Mallorcan government have realised that actually uh, lesbians have, have a high spending power and actually bring a lot of money to the island. Now, I'm not saying, but you know, what can Guernsey do that can actually become a welcoming place for all and to be a shining light? Now, from where I sit, um, the question of faith and sexuality is very key. And the high levels of Christianity on this island and the way that uh, Christ is worshipped here means you could become a beacon for understanding uh, together what it is to be f fully inclusive as churches, to understand the clobber text, that they are not there to kill LGBT people. And in fact, they've been badly misunderstood, that actually God loves us all. And you could witness that and model that and teach that and impact a larger nation across the water. So the challenge to you, I think, I say us, but it is you, because I don't live here, is can you go one step further? Could you become that beacon which can model inclusivity in all its forms to a, a, a broader world that looks to you for leadership? You have your ability to make your own laws, which is extraordinary. So you can go f much further than the UK at a much quicker speed. And I think that's the light that needs to, to shine from an island that's got the power to do it. It just needs the willpower. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. I married a Guernsey woman, born and bred, and that's how we came here. Uh, my children, you know, strongly call this home. Uh, I think we have to recognise that Guernsey has a problem too. We, whenever I mention that I come from Guernsey in the UK or anywhere, there's a sort of shiver. And there is this sense of stigma that it's attached to the island that I think we have really to recognize and to act on. Uh, the sense that we live in a very protected and elitist and Rich. wealthy mm -hmm. community and all things are absolutely wonderful here and you don't need to do anything mm -hmm. you just it's a playground for the wealthy this has to be changed mm -hmm. and this is not just something we have to do internally in the island but we have to actually project this to the outside world I don't want my children and grandchildren growing up with that stigma so it seems to me that we actually have some self-interest in challenging the way that we as a community operate. And if we were able, as Jane says, to move to being an inclusive um, beacon, mm. then I think we would say, an enor and actually, dare I say it, a green beacon, mm -hmm. uh, then I think we would be saying an enormous amount to the world that would make us proud to be Guernsey people and not have to sort of shadow away from it and not mention that we come from Guernsey. So for me, there is something quite important about understanding that the island has a kind of responsibility to the next generation to transform the stigma and to make itself a real uh, yeah, beacon, um, whatever it is, it's, it, it's absolutely the high spot where people go to to find an inclusive community. And we could do it. We could do it. But it will take more than just willpower. It takes resources. It takes leadership. Above all, it takes political will. And, and I, courage. And courage. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe we can find it. I hope we can. You may have to come back and live here. Yeah. <laughs> I'd love to. I'm, I'm, just going, I'm going to take one minute. I want to really honour James. James turned up as a teacher. Believe it or not, we're, we're not 
too different in age, but <laughs> old enough for him to be teaching when I was in sixth form, in a girls' school where uh, none of us had really had to encounter facial disfigurement before or indeed. And you challenged the very core of us and you <laughs> changed a generation of us. And I think that courage, that leadership, that role modelling is what we all saw and needed. And James, thank you. You've cha changed a whole generation, I know, of young ladies because of your willingness to stand up front. And that's what I, I try and do now as an openly gay evangelist. I don't like going around telling everybody I'm gay. I mean, I just want to get on with my life. And, you know. <laughs> but people need to know it's possible, you know? And, and young people need to know it's okay. And Absolutely. we need to stand up. Absolutely. So whatever your area is, even if it, you, know, you can be a strong ally, the fact you need to stand and say it it's, is, is what is more, m the most important thing that could happen on this island at the moment Absolutely. is to break that silence, mm. which starting the conversation mm. is trying to do. And Thank, you. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And just a tiny bit of professor in me has to add, if, if we follow on exactly what James and Jane are saying, all the academic research will show that this will become a richer island. Ha, that if you create an inclusive community, this has been studied by Case Western Reserve, mm -hmm. University of Harvard, Yale, yeah. a lot of the business schools around the world. If you create a space where people feel comfortable, creative people feel comfortable, they come and stick with you, and their creativity leads to an enrichment of everyone. Absolutely. So, you know, in some ways we're just blowing a chance when, <laughs> when we, could, we could open up this beauty and this community to that little bit more and make it a mecca for those creators, which would create wealth for all of us. Good. Amen. I just want to say to thank you very much, obviously, our three um, members of the panel. And if you do have any questions, I'm sure they'll be happy to answer them. Sorry that we ran out of time, but give them a last round of applause. <laughs> And I would like to suggest a big round of applause for Tabitha, who's been absolutely great chairing this panel today. <laughs>